College Jaipur. So today uh, we have a faculty talk on clinical urodynamics. We will start the session uh, with uh, Saraswati with our Saraswati Vandana. Saraswati Namastubhyam Varde Kamarupini Vidyarambham Karishami Again, welcome uh, to our teaching session. And uh, so I will just introduce uh, the speaker today. So today uh, we have a talk on clinical urodynamics by none other than Dr. Sanjay Sinha. And I think everybody knows Dr. Sanjay Sinha. Uh, he is professor and senior consultant urologist at Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad. Uh, he has been the chairperson of USI guidelines on urinary incontinence. He is the regional editor of SIU Journal, associate editor of BMC Urology, uh, avoiding dysfunction section. He is in the editorial board of Indian Journal of Urology, International Urogyne Journal, Current Bladder Dysfunction. And he has been also in the Eurodynamics Committee of the 7th International Consultation on Incontinence. So uh, most welcome Dr. Sanjay Sinha to our teaching program here. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, today we have two special invitees with us. Uh, Uh, Dr. Siri Shyamde. Dr. Siri Shyamde, uh, are you there? Uh, so he must be uh, there. He must be. So he would come or join us uh, soon. Uh, again, he's Dr. Siri? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hello. Yeah. So Dr. Siri uh, is a chief urologist and director of academics at Ruby Hall Clinic, Pune. Uh, he has a special interest in urodynamics. He runs an exclusive urodynamic lab in Pune where he performs and reports almost a thousand cases every year. And he has a special interest in functional urology and has recently set up a center called Crystal Center for Urinary Incontinence and Neurourology in the city of Pune. And he is also part of the multidisciplinary committee to look after uh, children who have uh, meningomyelocene. So uh, welcome Dr. Shirish uh, to our teaching program. Thanks for accepting our invitation. And then we have uh, Dr. Anita Patel. Uh, Dr. Anita Patel, again, uh, doesn't need any introduction. We know in um, lot, uh, most of the conferences, we can see her in our urology forum. Uh, she is a trained at, she's trained at Mumbai KM Hospital. She has been a consultant urologist for last 22 years. She has been the visiting uh, consultant and teacher at MPUH Nadiad. And she was also holding a position in KEM Hospital in 2017-80. And uh, she has been in faculty in over 50 national and international urology conferences. And she is also a panelist in urinary incontinence guidelines by USI in 2019, and also uh, neurogenic bladder by SIU in 2016. So most welcome Dr. Anita uh, to our teaching program. So now I would request uh, Dr. Sanjay Sina to please share his presentation and start with. Program. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. Uh, so my, my first interaction with Dr. Shivam was a long, long time ago. I don't know whether he remembers it. He came down to Sanjay Gandhi Institute as a trainee from Jaipur. Do you remember that, Shiva? And uh, so we were kind of contemporaries uh, and uh, we used to go to each other's centers uh, to get some- 92, training. 93 maybe, yeah. <laughs> Precisely, so, so I was, I think in my first year when you actually came down, uh, so you came in, I think in 93 and to Sanjay Gandhi Institute. And so that was my first interaction with him and it's been a pleasant and a very nice uh, friendship that has developed over the years. Uh, so uh, greeting, greetings to the Department of uh, Urology, SMS Jaipur, you are pioneers in urology and in PCNL and a whole lot of other uh, specialized uh, subspecialties of urology. Greetings to Dr. Anita and Shirish, and uh, coincidentally, both of them are actually uh, co-panelists uh, uh, from the USI guidelines panel for Unai Incontinence. Very appropriate that you've got uh, the right faculty uh, with us. Uh, 
uh, and I'm sure they'll be able to add a lot of important stuff to what I talk about. So let me start by five illustrated cases to, to show how urodynamics can actually get positioned in our clinical practice. Examine a 60 year old woman who has unresponsive clinical mixed incontinence. Should we offer her stress incontinence surgery to salvage her incontinence or botulinum toxin? How do we decide? A young man with voiding difficulty, is he a candidate for bladder neck incision? A man with spinal cord injury with a low PVR, no clinical infections, uses abdominal strain to void, is it okay to allow him to void? That way. A child who underwent fulgration for PUV who has bilateral hydronephrosis, does this represent ongoing bladder dysfunction or is it just a memory change? Or a 70-year-old woman who has refractory voiding this difficulty, is this an underactivity? Can she benefit from some therapy and so on? So what are we going to discuss in the next 30 minutes? Briefly, what does the urodynamic trace represent? How do we recognize good quality? What are important artifacts in the urodynamics? What are clinical urodynamics applications for voiding and storage dysfunction for neurogenic lower tract dysfunction and pediatric voiding dysfunction? Clearly, if I've got to discuss this and I, I actually have 40 minutes, this is clearly going to be an abbreviated discussion. And uh, I guess each of the things that I discussed today could be uh, in their own right, a full hour's discussion. So let's first look at the underlying principles, quality control and some basic findings. So the basic setup for a urodynamics looks like this. You, you have two tubes placed into the bladder, one for filling the bladder and the other for measuring the bladder's pressure. You have one tube placed into the rectum, which measures by convention what we call the abdominal pressure. And the pressure recorded from the bladder is by convention known as the abdominal pressure. You have a filling system through which a pump uh, directs a pre-specified uh, uh, fluid at a pre-specified rate into the bladder. Uh, and then when the patient passes urine, you have a Euroflow meter, which records the pattern and rate at which the urine comes out. And if you put fluoroscopy for a Euro video urodynamics, there would be a CR imaging. So essentially the background for all this is that you record the vesicle pressure from the abdomen. Uh, you record, sorry, you record the vesicle pressure from the abdomen you record the uh, vesicle pressure so from the bladder, you record the abdominal pressure from the rectum, or you could record it from the vagina, but it's, it's usually not a, a very reliable recording from the vagina. And in patients who have had a colostomy, uh, you could do it from the colostomy. And you are really interested in the subtraction of these two values, which is called by convention, the detrusor pressure, p -det. Sorry for that mix up. Uh, the rate at which we fill the bladder is typically in milliliters per minute. And uh, it, to fill at a physiological rate would take hours to do. So you need to typically fill at supra physiological rates. You would like to fill at about 10% of the expected capacity in milliliters per minute. So let's say if you expect a capacity of 300, then filling at 30 milliliters per minute is usually okay. And these will all be supra physiological. Uh, in terms of what's physiological, if you take the body weight in kilograms and divide it by four, then that is considered the upper extreme of what could potentially be a physiological flow in that individual. Now, one note of caution, if you are doing urodynamics in a patient who has a neurological lesion T6 and above, please monitor the blood pressure because you can get catastrophic autonomic dysreflexia once in a while and it can kill the patient if you're not careful. So let's look at a trace here. And uh, uh, this here, uh, the first, the upper line is P vesicle. That's the, uh, the time axis. You have uh, red for rectum. You have the P debt value, and uh, which is a subtracted recording, as I said. From here to here is all up to this point, the filling systometry. And then towards the latter part is all the voiding systometry. Uh, so that's the P debt. This is the flow channel. That's the voided volume. Uh, here you can see is the place where the micturition command has been command has been given. Uh, that's the voiding pressure. You can see here uh, the voiding contraction, the flow. You can see that the EMG uh, often, but not always, shows an increase in activity as the bladder fills up. And then when you give the command to void, right at that moment, you can see just before uh, the detrusor contraction happens, actually the sphincter becomes silent. Uh, 
and uh, then you have the, the, fl the flow occurring. So the silence of the sphincter typically happens before the, the onset of the diffuser contraction. Uh, and so you can so the, the change in activity of the EMG sphincter is more important than absolute values. Uh, so we are more interested in relative values, not these absolute numbers that are seen here. So the Eurodynamics matrix essentially consists of looking at voiding and storage uh, 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 aspects of lower tract function, and you want to look at both the bladder as well as the outlet. So what are some of the general principles? Uh, the urodynamics should be interactive. You want to duplicate the patient's symptoms and you need to be cautious with incidental findings. Sometimes you can get, for instance, diffuse overactivity in a child, which is, or adult for that matter, induced by the test. Uh, you need to do real-time interpretation or have somebody do the real-time interpretation. For instance, if there is staccato voiding where you get a kind of intermittent flow, you need to see, was there some other reason why it happened? Is it truly dysfunctional voiding or something else? Sometimes asymptomatic findings might be crucially important, and this is very uh, 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 true for neurogenic uh, lower tract dysfunction patients where uh, you know storage abnormalities and so on may be very important, even if they're not symptomatic. Uh, you want to report or at least be prepared with what the report is going to be before the patient leaves the suite. Uh, and as I always say, the urodynamics should not be regarded as a test. It's a three-step consultation process where you first assess the patient, then the urodynamics, and then reassess the patient to give a final uh, answer as to what's to be done next. So let's look at certain points uh, in terms of quality control. So how do we recognize whether a patient, uh, whether a, a study is actually of a good quality? So uh, some of the, a few things here. So the resting pressure is the first thing you want to look at. And the resting pressure should not be zero when you start. So you can see here the abdominal and the vesicle pressures are not zero. Uh, these pressures, uh, transducers are zero to the atmosphere. And because they're zero to the atmosphere, there's some finite pressure in the abdomen, even at a baseline resting state. So that baseline resting pressure is what is reflected here when you start the study. So even before you start filling, there is certain pressure, which is the resting abdominal pressure, which will vary depending on the position of the patient and more importantly, depending on, on the, the body morphology. Uh, we don't have good standardization for children. These, are, these values which are given here for, are for adults. Uh, we are in fact currently in the process, the functional and female urology subsection is actually doing a study across five centers to try and get data for the first time globally on these resting pressures in children. Um, you can see the initial P that should be uh, on, the, on the other hand, close to zero. So when you subtract these two, it should be close to zero. And this is the one that we are interested in. Now, you might ask me, how does it matter whether you have zeroed here to the, uh, these two transducers to the atmosphere or to the patient? Even if you zero to the patient, it won't make any difference to the p debt values. But there are certain situations, let's say, for instance, if you're doing an abdominal leak point pressure measurement, where when you look at the abdominal pressure, your recordings would be grossly under-recorded if you had zeroed to the patient. The other thing you can notice here is periodic cough. So there's a cough done in the beginning to start with, and you can see a reasonably good subtraction. There are periodic coughs in between a cough at the end of filling at the point where the patient is told to void and a cough at the end of the test to make sure that the transducers continue to function well at the end of the, of the study. The other thing to look at is the fine trace match. So if you look at the fine pattern here, the fine pattern seems to match each other. And this fine pattern, which you see here, can be because the patient moved a little, is talking and so on. And when you get this match of the fine tracing, it, it reassures that both the transducers are working perfectly and continue to work perfectly as we are doing the test. Uh, the micturition command should be recorded either electronically or by a manual label. That's important because some of, sometimes it's difficult to differentiate whether you're talking of a phasic contraction or a volitional void uh, unless it's actually been labeled so. Right. Now let's look at some common artifacts. And I'm going to show you four or five different artifacts here. Now, this looks like these are phasic contractions, and we'll come to this in a moment. Uh, and it seems that the pressures towards the end of filling are rising because this is the P-debt line. But if you look more carefully at the abdominal line, you find that the abdominal pressure is showing a wavy pattern. Now, if you remember, I told you that P-debt is uh, derived by a subtraction of P-abdomen from P-vesicle. What that also tells you is that you can't get a valid deflection in P-debt uh, 
without a corresponding deflection in the vesicle channel. So if you find any pressure change on PDET, look at the vesicle channel. And if you don't find something there, it's got to be an artifact. So you can see here there's spontaneous rectal activity, and this is not detrus overactivity, it's an artifact. And what looks like a reduced terminal compliance is in fact, uh, uh, there's a drift of rectal pressure as the patient's, uh, as the abdominal, as the bladder is being filled because there's a leak at some point or there's an air bubble or something causing interfering with the rectal pressure record. And that drift down is reflected in what looks like poor compliance. So it's not really poor compliance because you can see the vesicle pressure is a flat line, almost a flat line, very little rise towards the end. Some other things you can see if you fill too fast, this patient has been filled very fast, the pressure goes up dramatically. Uh, and this uh, poor compliance is almost certainly overestimated uh, the, the, uh, the pressures. And you can see the, the sign of that is clue to that is you stop filling and you find the pressure going down. And this accommodation which you get in pressure on stopping the filling is a sign that you are actually filling too fast. And you can see the same thing happen here that when this patient didn't void, the bladder was filled a little bit more and it seems as if there's a volitional contraction. This is not a volitional contraction. This is additional filling done. And you can see again that same rise. And then when the patient is to, tries to void, all these deflections that you see here during voiding, this, these are not volitional contractions. Such sharp changes in pressure can't happen because of detrusor because detrusor is a smooth muscle and it takes time for smooth muscles to recruit. So whenever you see sharp rise and fall in pressure like this, it has to come from a, from a skeletal muscle, not from a spoon muscle. And these are actually abdominal strain artifacts because of subtraction errors. Let's look at some of the basic findings that you can get. Now we know during storage, ordinarily the bladder pressure should be close to zero or flat line. So if you don't get a flat line close to zero, it can take one of two forms. You can either get a phasic rise and fall, which you are seeing here. This is called detrusor overactivity, or you can get what's called poor compliance, which is a progressive rise in pressure. That's called poor compliance. So these are two cardinal findings. These are not the only findings, but two cardinal findings during storage. Clearly, there are some situations where storage sensations can be critical, for instance, in bladder uh, pain patients and so on. Uh, uh, but these are two important findings in terms of patient health, upper tract function, and so on. So what is compliance? Compliance actually reflects change in volume per unit change in pressure. Uh, we uh, hence express it as, as uh, ml per centimeter of water. And typically, we take these points between which we are measuring the pressure as the end fill and the beginning of filling. But you could theoretically take any two points and measure the compliance between them. So here, for instance, if I filled 40, 140 ml and I've had a pressure of 40 or so, it means roughly, let's say, that it's like 3 ml per, per centimeter water, so it's very poor compliance. The other findings relate to, out, to, to, the, to the voiding function. And you can see here two important findings. This is a patient where at, at, after the patient has been given the command to void, there's a very high pressure and a very slow flow. This combination of findings is, is classical of obstruction. So to, uh, to draw um, an analogy to somebody sitting in a room and trying to push a door open to go out, uh, if the door is not opening, it could be because of two reasons. Either the door is jammed or I'm not able to push the door effectively. So this is a situation where the door to the bladder is jammed. And if the door is jammed and if I'm normal, you would expect me to push very hard to open the door. And that's precisely what the bladder typically does. So a normal bladder will push much harder than it normally would to try and open the, the outlet if there's an obstruction and you'd get a slow flow despite that. So that's bladder outlet obstruction. And uh, this, on the other hand, is a very poor detrusor contraction. So once the micturition command is given here, there's barely a contraction. You could even call this an A-contractile detrusor. Most of these look like a, a subtraction artifact. So these are some of the cardinal findings that you could get in a patient in whom you do urodynamics. So now let's look at some of the applied urodynamic findings in certain conditions. And also let's try and answer the question relating to those five clinical conditions I told you about. So first, female urinary incontinence. And what are the possible urodynamic findings? So I'm not going to into the theory of when to do the urodynamics and so on. But if uh, typically you would plan to do an invasive urodynamics only at the point where you are looking at invasive therapies. Uh, that's what our guidelines also, the USI guidelines states. 
So what are the potential findings that you could get when you do urodynamics in a patient with refractory urinary incontinence? You could get urodynamic stress incontinence, detruso overactivity with or without incontinence. You could get urodynamic mixed incontinence. You could get cough associated detruso overactivity with incontinence, urgency with detruso overactivity, reduced compliance, alternate diagnosis like avoiding dysfunction, and normal. So you could have a patient who has overactive bladder wet where the patient has normal findings. Uh, and that doesn't uh, exclude a diagnosis of, of OAB wet. So take a look at this patient and let's say, for instance, she has refractory <clears throat> mixed urinary incontinence. And this is where we have been filling the bladder up to this point. And you can see here straight away that there is a, a high pressure, there's a, there's a phasic contraction during filling and the patient has leaked a substantial amount of urine. It's like 250 ml of urine, which has come out uh, with this phasic contraction. Uh, sorry. With this phasic contraction. So this patient has detrusor overactivity incontinence. But thereafter, in this patient, uh, a cough stress test has been done. And in the cough stress test, in the beginning, this patient does not leak. So you can see here, the catheters are in place, the patient doesn't leak. And typically then we make these patients stand up. And then if they don't leak uh, at that point, we remove their urethral catheter and that's what's been done. And hence you can see a sudden drop in the vesicle pressure when the catheter has been removed. And when you do that, now you can unmask stress incontinence here. So not all women will leak during a stress test uh, with a catheter in C2 and hence, you need to remove the catheter uh, in uh, these women if they don't leak, if they have a history suggestive of stress incontinence. So if there is a woman who has this kind of a pattern and you find high pressure detrusor overactivity incontinence, you can see very large volumes of incontinence. And if the symptoms match up to, uh, it seems to be primarily a, a mixed incontinence with the urgency con if component dominating, you might consider actually botulinum rather than uh, stress incontinence surgery because botulinum is simple and can be removed reversed very easily, unlike a stress incontinence surgery. Right, and remember, you need to zero to the atmosphere because you can see here now that when you record the detrusor leak, the abdominal leak point pressure, if you have not zeroed to the, to the, to the atmosphere, then this 20 centimeters would be the discrepancy in your recording of the, detrusor, of the abdominal leak point pressure. What are the criteria for defining intrinsic sphincter deficiency in such a setting? Intrinsic sphincter deficiency, if, if the abdominal leak point pressure is less than 60, this patient has, <clears throat> has severe ISD. Between 60 and 90, it's a mild ISD. You can get a clue to, to uh, ISD by a clinical test called the empty bladder supine stress test, where in the lithotomy position, after having voided urine, a woman is asked to cough. And if she leaks, you find a trickle of urine happening. That's, that's, that is suggestive of ISD. And that's a clinical test for making a diagnosis <clears throat> of ISD. Sometimes you can get what's called cough-associated detrusor overactivity. And you can see here two different types of cough-associated detrusor overactivity. This is a patient in whom the leak happens with the cough, but there is CADO. Here you can see the leak happens both with the cough as well as with the phasic contraction. This is another type of CADO. So you can get various different types of cough-associated detrusor overactivity uh, during the test. And it's important to recognize these so that you can offer the right treatment to your patient. The USI guidelines state that invasive urodynamics may be omitted in women with uncomplicated stress incontinence. And while I will not go into details of this, suffice to say that you have to be very metic uh, meticulous in your application of the definition uh, and very scrupulous in making sure that every aspect of the definition is adhered to. Uh, that onus is on us. And any woman who doesn't perfectly fit into that definition should undergo a urodynamics prior to surgery. Uh, invasive urodynamics is also recommended in men, men and women with urgency incontinence prior to invasive therapies by the USI guideline. But remember, other international guidelines do not recommend this. And the reason for the USI guideline to recommend this with a level three evidence and grade, uh, a weak grade of recommendation is primarily to exclude other diagnoses. We feel that botulinum and, and uh, sacral neuromodulation are both invasive therapies which are expensive with potential for harm. And it's important to exclude other diagnoses which are not uncommon like voiding dysfunction. Uh, so it's not to make a diagnosis but it's to exclude a diagnosis. So findings of DO or lack of finding of DO during the, the test uh, does not make a difference to the outcome of botulinum injection or sacral neuromodulation. 
Next, let's look at men with voiding difficulty. And, the, uh, and if you look at the non-invasive tests like a Euroflow, these, it's not perfect. The Euroflow uh, with a cutoff of 10 milliliters per second has a specificity of about 70 and a sensitivity about 50%. The residual urine about 50%, 50% positive and negative predictive value with a 50 ml cutoff. We know that patients may be severely obstructed despite no residual urine and patients may have an enlarged prostate without an obstruction. Uh, what are the indications for doing urodynamics? Uh, these, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, essentially patients who have an age, who, patients who are young or patients who are, are in the geriatric age group, patients with very large residual urines, patients who have a high flow but still complain of avoiding difficulty, patients who have an underlying neurological diagnosis, storage symptoms dominant, not able to produce a valid uroflow with adequate volume, such patients should have a urodynamics prior to a surgery for the bladder outlet. Let's look at this young man. So I gave you one problem where there's a 49 year old male who has uh, uh, voiding LUTs and you are not sure what the cause is. And this is the urodynamic trace. Once again, that's the P vesicle line, the P abdomen line, that's P dead, the subtracted line. This P dead you can see here during storage is normal. Voiding, there's a high pressure and a slow flow characteristic of obstruction. Uh, you can see here that this patient also shows EMG activity during uh, voiding phase, but I must caution you that uh, EMG is the least reliable part of the test. And there are several times where the EMG is, is not, uh, doesn't give us the right answer. So the, uh, of, uh, over the last two, three years now, we have almost stopped relying on EMG at all in such settings. And if we at all suspect that the patient has a dysfunctional void, we would uh, invariably in such patients do a video study. Uh, and you can see here in the video study, I'll just bring it to the part where this patient has voided. And you can see here that as this patient voids, you can see the bladder neck is closed. So there's a very high pressure and you can see <clears throat> a closed bladder neck. Uh, the prostatic urethra is not dilated. And this is character <clears throat> characteristic of, of primary bladder neck obstruction. So although the EMG seems to suggest that it's a dysfunctional void, this is not a dysfunctional void. This is a primary bladder neck obstruction. And this patient should do extremely well with a, with a bladder neck incision. Uh, there is another concept that I would like to introduce in relation to all this uh, in, the, in the male patient, and this is primarily meant for the elderly male, but it's applied very often to the younger male as well. In this patient, you can see that the P dead max, the P dead Q max is about 120, the Q max is about six, and there are two indices that we often calculate the bladder outlet obstruction index, which is P dead Q max minus two into the Q max, and the bladder contractility index, which is P dead Q max plus five into Q max. And in this patient, you can see the BOOI is 108 and anything above 40 is a severe obstruction. The contractility index is 150, which is a, a strong contraction. Having said that, these indices are far from perfect. Uh, our own data suggests that the median bladder contractility index uh, in about 1600 patients whom we have just reported it's uh, under consideration in a journal uh, was about 98 or 99, if I remember correctly, said, telling us that half the patients in whom we end up doing urodynamics actually have contractilities in the weak contraction zone. So that's too blunt an instrument to take any decisions. Uh, in fact, if you look at these two indices, you have two uh, uh, levels, or you can say grades of abnormality for the outlet obstruction index, BOI. So you have 20 and 40 with equivocal and severe obstruction, and one uh, category of normalcy with the obstruction index. But you have two categories of normalcy with the contractility index, 150 strong contraction, 100 to 150 normal contraction, but only one subcategory of abnormality with the contractility index. So this is unsatisfactory. We are currently in the process of a Delphi study uh, with three other international investigators to actually look at this to see whether we should be having subclassifications of the contractility index. We'll next go to neurogenic lower tract dysfunction. And let's examine one patient who's 31 years old with a history of anorectal malformation, denies major voiding difficulty, has episodes of urgency and urgency incontinence, one to two febrile illnesses in a year, constipated but is able to manage. Or he's ambulatory with normal upper tract function and keen and a keen intellect. And let's look at his urodynamic trace to try and answer whether the trace on its own can tell us whether this patient is safe or not. Now, if you remember, 
uh, we have we we discussed very briefly that storage pressures are important. So we know that storage pressures and voiding pressures function both is important for the upper tract. And in this particular patient, it appears that the storage pressure is good. So again, look at the PDET line. The storage pressure looks low. Let's speed it. Uh, the patient has a normal capacity, normal compliance, no ne neurogenic detrums over activity. There's some spontaneous rectal activity. The end fill pressure is about 10. That's a place where it's given the command to void a contractile abdominal strain, no PVR. You can see the patient empty the bladder. Looks like a bladder which is safe, right? Is spontaneous voiding okay? The answer here is we don't have enough information to take a decision. You need more information in this patient. And I'll tell you what, more information. We needed some more information in terms of imaging of this patient. And especially we need to do in any neurogenic patient a video study or combined with an MCG. So let's take a look at this patient's video study. And uh, let me again scroll down. And you can see here this patient shows reflux as the bladder is being filled up. So these pressure estimates are an underestimate because the patient is actually refluxing to the kidney and there's a large volume reflux. The ureter is grossly dilated. See that, a large volume reflux. So all this pressure that you are seeing is a gross underestimate of the true pressure. And when you go to the voiding phase here with abdominal strain, you can see there's a dilatation of the prostatic urethra and there is some reflux into the prostatic glands, all suggesting that when this patient does the Creed's maneuver, uh, or the Valsalva strain to try and void, this patient is actually having a dyssynergic pelvic floor activity and it's not safe for the patient to do what he's doing. And this is actually reflected in more information which I can give you, share with you now on this patient. This patient actually came with a creatine of five, has, a, has no residual urine but bilateral hydronephrosis. So this patient clearly is not safe. Uh, so this is a, a good point to introduce a couple of more concepts related to this. The first concept is detrusor leak point pressure and then the detrusor leak point volume. Now in patients in whom you're doing a, a, a urodynamic study in a neurogenic setting, when you fill the bladder, sometimes you can get a progressive rise in pressure as you can see in this patient. And at some point by the side of the catheter, fluid starts leaking out. When that happens, the volume at which that leak happens is the detrusor leak point volume, and the pressure at which this leak happened is the detrusor leak point pressure. Uh, this detrusor leak point pressure, in a sense, is a reflection of, of the uh, outlet resistance and the compliance, or you can say the elasticity of the bladder wall. So if there's a high leak point pressure, it suggests that the, the kidneys are going to get exposed to high pressures when this patient is not on CIC. So if the patient is just leaking out into a receptacle, diapers or whatever, or in a control manner in the toilet even, uh, but when this patient leaks out, this patient leaks out at pressures which are potentially damaging for the kidneys. So detrusor leak point pressure and detrusor leak point volume combined can give us some idea about safety. Let's look at storage and safety. Now, there, was some, there were some thoughts that a pressure of 40 centimeters is a cutoff for what's safe. Uh, please banish that thought. Uh, we know that pressures much lesser than 40 will not may not be safe. Any pressure above 20 should not be accepted. That doesn't mean that a pressure of 10 is safe. And I just showed you in that patient, just uh, the case that we showed two slides earlier. A low pressure doesn't imply safety, but a high pressure clearly implies lack of safety, right? The, 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 one more concept related to storage is what is called the neurogenic detrusor overactivity leak point pressure. Now, NDO just implies that the, the, the detrusor overactivity is in a neurogenic setting. And you can see here that NDO is occurring as we are filling the bladder and the pressure at which the patient leaks is called the NDO leak point pressure. This is a relatively newer concept and there's very little data to show uh, how this pressure is associated with upper tract damage and prognosis of the patient. We don't really have good quality data on this. Uh, so you can see here NDO leak point pressure. Uh, is it 100? No, not really 100. Is the lowest pressure at which the patient leaks. So in this patient, the NDO leak point pressure is actually 48 and not 100 because the lowest pressure at which the patient leaked with a phasic contraction was 48. The pattern of pressure rise is important. And you can see here two children, one in whom the pressure rises rapidly, but not to the extent that, that it rises in the other child. But in the other child, the pressure rise is much slower through all of filling. And especially if this patient is having a CIC volume, let's say of 250, and this pressure is starting to rise after say 300, this patient is likely to be safe despite a high leak point pressure. And this patient may not be safe despite a relatively lower leak point pressure. So just the detrusor leak point pressure is not important. You need to add information 
question with regard to what's the average CIC volume and the pressure in the bladder at that volume. And what this tells you is you can't manage a patient with neurogenic bladder without a CIC diary. So you must have a CIC diary in all these patients. Uh, one last uh, case study before we go to the next subject, and this is on another patient who's 17 years old with a history of a fall and an injury D11, D12. Uh, and this is a patient who has a classical finding, which we must again look at. And this is the classical detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. Let me show this to you. And you can see here a, a, a grossly abnormal bladder morphology, a hugely dilated prostatic urethra with reflux into the prostatic glands. Uh, and this is a classical detrusor sphincter dyssynergia when this patient uh, makes an attempt to avoid. So this patient is clearly unsafe. And if this patient is allowed to avoid, allowed to avoid for any length of time, it is almost mathematical that this patient would end up with damage to the upper tracts. So some crucial lessons for the neurogenic subgroup, patients with high risk diagnosis must have urodynamics. And what are the high risk diagnosis? Spina bifida, spinal cord injury, and erectile malformation. And then any other uh, neurogenic patient in whom the, the urodynamic findings or the clinical findings are a high risk findings. Uh, urodynamics must include or combine, must be combined with contrast imaging of the lower tract. Ideally, we do, but you could do uh, uh, a UDS with a VCUG, and that's a, an acceptable, absolutely acceptable alternative. Uh, ability to void is not important, neither is ability to hold. What is important is whether the voiding and the, the storage are safe. Uh, and detrusor leak point pressure or any urodynamic finding for that matter is not enough to take decisions regarding safety. So urodynamics can tell you lack of safety, but can't tell you that the patient is safe. That's a clinical decision based on the overall assessment. A few words about PUV and hydronephrosis. Let's look at a patient who has PUV and hydronephrosis and, and continue. And you, the question is, is the hydronephrosis due to, due to an ongoing bladder dysfunction? And you will get some clues from the symptoms in this patient, the progress when you log longitudinally follow up the patient in terms of morphology. Uh, look at the MCUG, which is the current MCUG of this patient, <clears throat> match it up with the pre-op MCUG. And although this looks bad in terms of the urethra, this urethral dilatation is much lesser than the urethral dilatation pre-op. This patient has good voiding stream. So this patient who is voiding well shows improvement in urethral morphology, but shows deterioration in bladder morphology. So you can see the bladder looks worse. The urethra looks better, and that's reflected in this patient showing upper tract changes, which are progressive. Uh, and this patient has progressively increasing detrusor pressure as the bladder is filled up. There's a poorly compliant bladder along with phasic detrusor contractions, both of which are bad for the upper tracts. We'll next go to voiding dysfunction in women. And I think that's the last subgroup. Uh, there, there are various causes for voiding dysfunction in women. It could be an underactive detrusor, dysfunctional voiding. Uh, dysfunctional voiding implies that there's dyssynergia of the striated sphincter or pelvic floor muscles in the absence of a neurological, a neurogenic etiology. Most patients are supposed to present with staccato voiding, but as we have published before, a, a lot many patients don't show staccato voiding and actually can show a flat curve as well. Uh, you can have primary bladder obstruction, a relatively less common diagnosis. Anatomical obstruction, far less common. Uh, and I continue to believe that many patients are overdiagnosed with strictures. Unsuspected neurogenic dysfunction, all these are potential reasons for getting voiding dysfunction in women. And uh, the relative proportion of these two diagnoses obviously is different between a man and a woman. Uh, the criteria for diagnosing obstruction in women is also different, and that's because of differences in lower unit tract and pelvic floor physiology between men and women. And so we would label a woman obstructed at a far lower pressure compared to men. So if the voiding pressure is above 20 with a flow which is slow, uh, then in a woman we would call this a, a bladder outlet obstruction. Uh, having said that, uh, a patient who's voiding at, let's say, 25 centimeters of water with 10 ml per, uh, per second flow rate, although obstructed, also has an underactive detrusor. But uh, underactivity is even poorer in terms of definition in women, and we really don't have any data as to what to, what to call underactive in a woman at this point of time. Uh, take a look at this woman in whom who has a person's refractory voiding difficulty. And you can see here, the storage phase looks fine. That's the voiding phase, maturation command. And there's a somewhat elevated pressure and a slow flow. The voiding pressure is about, these are 20, 20 marks. So this is about 55 or so centimeters voiding pressure and a flow about seven or eight. So she is obstructed uh, based on all criteria. Uh, let's look why she's obstructed. And again, let me scroll the video here to the point where she's voiding. 
And you can see here that she has a dilatation of the proximal part of the urethra as she voids. So the bladder neck opens well. She has a dyssynergic striated sphincter pelvic floor uh, uh, activity because of which she is having bladder outlet obstruction. So she is in the absence of a neurological etiology, this would be a dysfunctional voider uh, and needs to be managed as such. Uh, uh, one other common condition in women, pelvic organ prolapse and voiding difficulty typically happens in uh, prolapse, which is beyond the, the, the hymen or the introitus. And uh, simply doing the urodynamics, both with and without a pessary, you can see how much improvement in voiding function can be seen here. And if you see this kind of improvement in voiding, this voiding function, it reassures you that putting back the prolapse is likely to resolve the woman's voiding symptoms uh, uh, if this happens. This is not always demonstrable in all women, but it certainly reassures you. And if this doesn't happen, uh, it's probably best to prognosticate the woman that it's possible that your voiding problems might not resolve uh, after the prolapse is put back. Uh, one final question which we are often asked as urologists and uh, is the question as, as to whether the chronic renal damage that you see in a patient secondary to the lower tract and an ancillary question is, is the storage phase more important or the voiding phase more important in terms of upper tract damage? And um, if you look at all textbooks, let's say indications for it for, for doing a TURP, for instance, uh, in, the, in the indications you'll find hydronephrosis. So it has been kind of assumed that obstruction causes hydronephrosis. And uh, uh, we know that uh, if, uh, you know, if you, the, the mechanism by which upper tract gets damaged typically is the lower tract should typically produce hydronephrosis before damage to the upper tracts. Uh, so as far as the first part of the question is chronic renal damage secondary to lower tract dysfunction, in the absence of any hydronephrosis, and the caveat is that the patient mustn't have had a catheter uh, when you are assessing the patient, in the absence of hydronephrosis, upper tract damage is unlikely to be secondary to the lower tract. So the sequence of events should be lower tract dysfunction, development of morphological changes in the upper tract followed by de uh, deterioration in renal function. So in a, in a chronic stage, you don't expect upper tract uh, damage to occur in the absence of hyper hydronephrosis with a lower tract dysfunction. But as I said, the important question is, is, uh, is obstruction important or is storage important? And this is a question that we've tried to answer actually for the first time, surprisingly, because this is such a common uh, issue in our, in, our, in our wards, but somehow has not really been examined in literature before. And this is, uh, uh, again, from the same body of 1,596 patients, uh, which we reported. And you can see these are eight different categories of patients for storage and uh, voiding problems. And these are the predicted probability of hydronephrosis. And you can see here that the predicted probability of hydronephrosis is, is much higher in patients who have storage abnormalities compared to patients who have isolated obstruction. So in fact, in our patients, storage abnormality uh, had higher odds, uh, had the highest odds of developing patients, uh, developing hydronephrosis, but isolated bladder outlet obstruction was not associated with hydronephrosis in our, uh, in our patients. Uh, uh, underactivity was uh, 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 patients who were having underactivity seemed to be protected unless they developed uh, large PVRs. So those patients with underactivity who developed a large PVR again went on to damage their upper tracts. But if they were underactive but with low PVRs, then again their upper tracts were safe. Right. So uh, as I said, patients with so if I flip this around. So patients who come to us with severe storage disorders at urodynamics, so whether it's neurogenic, not neurogenic or whatever, if they have severe storage disorders, those are the groups of patients in whom you are to be, you need to be very careful because such patients can damage their upper tracts. And you must have seen this. There are patients, for instance, they're young men uh, with primary blood neck obstruction who come to you with a creatine of five. And uh, you do their urodynamics, you find that they've got bad outlets, but they have consequentially also developed bad storage. Uh, or that they have very large residuals and they have damaged their upper tracts. Uh, so uh, the storage is extremely important. If you find bad storage in any patient in whom you do urodynamics, very important uh, to count, counsel these patients that if they don't follow themselves very care, follow up very carefully, you might end up with renal deterioration. So you can use this to mathematically predict which are the patients who are actually going to develop trouble uh, in the long run. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and. Let me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Back you very to, much, Dr. Sure. Sanjay. And that was a very uh, nice way of uh, presentation on on different case scenarios. So we do, uh, I think, uh, a practical way of uh, presentation which will benefit our residents also a lot. Uh, so now I would uh, request uh, our invitees.
Dr. Shirish and Dr. Anita. So to begin with Dr. Shirish, um, uh, if you have any comments uh, on uh, what was presented here, and uh, besides that, uh, uh, what do you think is the role of urodynamics uh, in your clinical practice and uh, how do you take it? So first, yeah. we begin with Dr. Shirish. Yeah. You want me to comment on what Sanjay said? <laughs> yeah, if you have any, if you have any comments. Be, be uh, merciful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Sanjay and I always have some uh, um, subtle differences in thoughts, but I mean, I won't bring it up here because basically this was a very, very um, uh, highly demonstrative uh, exposition and it has been almost everything has been exposed. But what was your um, um, second part of your question, uh, Shivam? What is the role of urodynamics in what? In your clinical practice, what do you think is the role of urodynamics and where do you actually do urodynamics? Uh, okay. Okay. I, I think that that's, that's a very broad question to answer. But um, uh, see, I mean, urodynamics is done in our institution as at a request of the referring physicians, clinicians, usually urologists and gynecologists, essentially. Um, really speaking, I do understand that not all patients who come to us actually need urodynamics. They need a lot many more uh, non-invasive investigations before urodynamics is done. But uh, yes, I mean, I'll give you an example. For example, uh, a patient with a, a cerebrovascular accident has got urgency incontinence and is invariably such patients are referred to urodynamic departments to find out so why they have urodynamic, why they should, they, they should be incontinent. Obviously, we find the patients with, uh, with uh, cerebrovascular, am I heard that? Yeah, yes, so, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm not able to see any screen. Yeah. Uh, the patients who have got cerebrovascular accident are, bought, uh, are once they settle, once they settle after the uh, cerebral stroke period is over, they settle into a tetrazo overactivity with usually with a very um, synchronous uh, relaxation of pelvic floor. So they don't have any asynchronous um, uh, moment of the sphincter and they fairly de develop a good amount of um, ability to, to have a synchronous pelvic floor. So they don't have anything called dysphagia dysanergia and they are fairly safe bladder. All they have is that they do not and they do not perceive the urgency, but they have urinary incontinence all the same. So all these patients do not actually need dynamic evaluation. They could be managed very well without it. Um, on the other hand, we have patients, let's say, Neurogenic dysfunction with meningomyelocele, for instance. Now, these patients have to have preemptive urodynamic evaluation without the patient complaining of any symptom, without the parents having any complaint. For example, parents feel the patient is avoiding very well, and I have no problem. But these are the patients who are potentially have disastrous storage in the carriage of the bladder, as we as Sanjay has explained. And these are the patients who require preemptive evaluation by urodynamics. At, at all means, and starting very early in life, that's what it is. The number of other issues where patients have um, neurological bladder dysfunction, which you don't realize, for example, patients with a tethered cord syndrome, suddenly you find a young man, young boy or a woman or, or a girl develops unexplained urinary symptoms at the age of 13 or 14, and we don't know why these developing those symptoms. Now, this is where the problem comes. When the cord tethering has occurred, you may not have noticed any signs to to define the cord tethering. They may have subtle external signs on the skin, but you may not even notice them. But these are the patients who would definitely require urodynamic evaluation to find out what are they going to be in the future. And they could, they can have substantially serious complications in the, in the future. So just to give you an, an overview, there are indications where you should do urodynamic in these cases. And there are indications where you need not do urodynamics in these cases. Does that answer my question? Oh, yeah. your question? Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siddhi. Yeah, uh, I would request now Ani Dr. Anita uh, yeah. to give her comments and then we will come to the questions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Perfect. Yeah, because there's some work going on in the vicinity and I could barely hear what was being spoken in the session. So I have landed up putting earphones. So I was just making sure I'm audible. By Sanjay. And I don't think I'm going to comment on anything that he said. 
um one peculiar thing which i have seen happening when we are talking about rectal pressure and the subtraction and the technicality is if the trace is not making sense and if you are seeing an unusual drift in the pressure trace just make sure that the bladder line is connected to the urethral catheter and the rectal is really connected to the rectal catheter this may sound stupid but i have seen interchange of rectal line being i mean the rectal transducer being connected to the vesical line and vice versa and as the compliance deteriorates the rectal pressure starts rising not the vesical because you connected the wrong line and the entire urodynamic tracing goes completely topsy turvy and you have to witness that to actually realize how uh, horrible the whole trace can look so i thought i'll just make a mention of that and sanjay it was wonderful you should use the analogy of a door not opening i wonder if it's given in any textbook or any paper anywhere because that's the exact analogy that i use for my patients that imagine you have to leave the room and the door is not opening if the door is wide open you will walk out like a king or a queen if the door is partially open you will use all your strength to open the door and if you still can't you will have to squeeze your body to get out of the room and that is exactly what happens in a good bladder with an obstructed urinary tract so it was very interesting that sanjay should use the same analogy i think we should move to the question answer so that we can do some meaningful discussion thank you thank you dr anita so uh there are a few questions uh, in the chat box one is related to pediatrics uh, I, we know uh, it's a, it's a, maybe a, a, a challenge to do a pediatric urodynamics and uh, so the one question was uh, uh, what is the earliest age at which we can do a pediatric urodynamics and the other uh, what special uh, precautions or what special preparations you do for doing a pediatric urodynamics so uh, in terms of the age you can do a urodynamics at any age so if there are children children who have high risk disease for instance spina bifida or open spinal dysrhythm or anorectal malformation they must have urodynamics as early as possible so the moment they've recovered from their initial surgical interventions neurosurgical pediatric surgical interventions that's the time to do it so you are literally looking at urodynamics within weeks or months of birth and there are situations where even a 6 month delay or a 12 month delay in a child with a bad bladder is enough to for the child to develop irreversible renal damage i have children 1 year old with just 12 months of delay with a with a bad bladder where there's irreversible ckd already because of the lower tract so must uh, assess as early as possible and you can get storage related phase information at any age avoiding phase information may be difficult in the small child but most often you can surmise regarding voiding based on the clinical constellation of findings talking to the parents looking at the ultrasound scan or just by clinical judgment uh, but the storage phase and i just showed you storage is much more critical in any 24 hour period we pass urine for maybe 10 minutes the rest of the 23 hours and 50 minutes we are storing urine hence what happens during storage has a much more profound impact on the kidneys compared to what happens during voiding so we can get all that information even in newborn now in terms of uh, uh, what preparation uh, is to be done i think the, the most important thing with the urodynamics in children that i have found is that once in a while once in a while you get a child who develops severe sepsis post nds and it's critically important and our, our our my feeling is this anecdotal i haven't studied it we should study and i hope at some point i can give you data on this that children who have upper tract dilatation or who have a, a chronic kidney disease related to the lower tract are particularly at higher risk Uh, and if one such episode can give, give rise to the child in the icu aki uh, on ckd and so on so number one always use prophylaxis in a child number two at the end of your study always empty the bladder that's true both for the mcg as, as well as for the urodynamics when you fill the bladder always fill at a rate which is which is slower than you know slow so i mean obviously what is slow so what is to me slow may not be slow to you but as a rough guide don't fill at more than 10% of the expected bladder capacity for the child uh, if you find that you are filling and the bladder pressures are going up slow down or stop 
And if you stop and you find the pressure coming down by that accommodation that I told you about, that's a sign that you're filling too fast, cut down the filling rate. If you start getting phasic contractions, stop. Again, cut, restart with a slower filling rate. So all that can help getting the most reliable pressure uh, information. Make the surroundings as comfortable as possible for a child. Have one parent when you're doing the test along with the child. If the children are capable, age capable of understanding, and I'd say any child who's five, six years probably can understand a bit. It's best to explain to the child what you're going to do. Tell them that there will be some discomfort. Telling a child that there won't be discomfort and then finding that they ha have fine pain or discomfort during the test is not the best way of gaining the child's trust. And especially if you want avoiding phase, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, for the uh, Give the child, as usual, the same privacy that you would afford uh, an adult. And you have to be patient, give enough time. Make sure that you get a Euroflow done up front. Very important. Uh, many of these children will not have enough Euroflow done from before, especially if it's a non-neurogenic setting, let's say a PUV child. Uh, so these are some of the things that I would look at during doing. Some of these children will have severe constipation as a part of their problem. Make sure that the, the bowels are empty because if the bowels are very full, then you won't get perfect information in terms of the bladder pressures. Uh, we know there's a crosstalk that happens between the uh, other pelvic organs and the bladder. So that those are some of the steps I would say are issues with related to a child. Any other thing you'd like to add? Uh, but but the, add? More, the most important problem here is how to manage a small child, right? So uh, that's what the, probably the... Oh, right, right, right. There was a question about uh, anesthesia. So whether, whether you want, would like to give some analgesic or kind, some kind of sedation to these children because uh, it, they, are very, uh, they are not manageable. Uh, right. So I, so I think the first is, uh, you know, if you have got more than one person in your team, the most experienced person handles the child. That's the first thing, because your confidence in doing the test makes a huge difference to the child's ability to cooperate. Uh, the other is, uh, you know, most often these earlier, I'd say a few years ago, there were many patients in whom we would give some amount of, you know, uh, trichloral or you would be pedichloral or we would sometimes put the, the tubes under anesthesia. Over the last few years, I've almost not done it at all. Uh, so in almost invariably, you know, you give a little time for the child to settle down. Don't try and immediately do the test after you put the tubes in and so on. And most often you can actually manage uh, and get the child to cooperate. Uh, so I, usually it's not an issue, but if you really do need to give anesthesia, you can do the test uh, at the time when the child is just coming out of anesthesia. Uh, and that's the, and don't use you know, muscle relaxing agents and all that. It should be fine to be able to do the test. So uh, what, how often you do in uh, pediatrics? pediatrics? Every day. Every day? Every day. So that's usually. And almost uh, every day. Almost every day. Smallest child is usually doing in infants also? Yeah, yeah. Even newborns, I just told you. So there's no problem as such. So, so in fact, the newborns won't give you problem. The problem right. happens with the slightly older child, not, not with the newborns. Uh, and uh, But as I said, most often it's possible to get the cooperation. You have to be patient and you can't have like, you know, when you're doing this, you can't put a time pressure on these children. That really makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. So your technician should have, so actually we have two aerodynamics machines in two adjoining rooms. And so we can manage these kids and all. Otherwise it's very difficult in one day to handle the volume that we have. So uh, uh, with children, you can't have a time pressure. And one thing about the, as you said uh, about the video aerodynamics uh, and you, uh, that video is uh, quite important in many of these scenarios, right? Video. So, but many of us do not have a video aerodynamics. We have, fine. Yeah. So, so how, how important is to have a video aerodynamic uh, to get a proper uh, result or proper. Uh, so, so if I would, uh, so to for the residents, Go back and look at the USI uh, uh, functional urology subsection talk that Anita gave. She gave a small two-minute capsule uh, on, on the use of imaging. And maybe I should ask Anita, allow Anita to answer this question. Yes, Anita, yes, you yes, like Dr. Anita? Dr. Anita? Yes, imaging. Imaging. Uh, so, so video Yeah, so you're specifically asking about pediatrics, aren't you, Dr. Shivam? I think he's asking in general. Not, not pediatrics. It's just uh, for uh, general. general. Uh, video. How important it is to have a video aerodynamics? Uh, okay. So first of all, it would be ideal if anybody with interest in aerodynamic has access to video aerodynamics. So that is the best option. If you do not have it, make sure you have adequate pre-aerodynamic imaging available so that at least you filter out those who may need either a simultaneous imaging or who at least need a separate pre-procedure MCU. 
so that very often gives you a lot of anatomical information so that even if you didn't have a simultaneous imaging you can correlate the urodynamic findings with say for example the case which sanjay showed the anorectal malformation which was allegedly safe pressure as per urodynamic criteria but it wasn't a safe pressure because everything which was being filled in the bladder was actually going in the upper tracts so the volumes were misleading the pressures were misleading but let's imagine if we had this mcu at least beforehand if not simultaneously our interpretation of the urodynamics will be far better so best situation would be to have it simultaneously if i can't have it simultaneously and if there is dilated upper tracts known to me before the uds and in pediatric i must always have a have a sonography before doing a uds if it is known to me and if i know i don't have access to a video i will insist on a pre procedure mcu i think that's the best that i can answer it so that i make sense out of my urodynamic trace by marrying my trace to the previously available mco findings um that that's the best that i could answer it thank so, you i think yes so if you do not have a video at least have a pre uh urodynamics mco and the other thing that we also do sometimes is we don't have to have superimposed images of the mcu on the uds screen even if you have facility of doing a simultaneous cystogram but the two images don't have to be superimposed as long as somebody is handling the x-ray cm and there is a uds going on simultaneously as long as the images are correlated with the trace i think that is all that you need now this is where in pediatric practice this may be the only situation where i may want a little sedation and i'm sure both sanjay and uh, shirish would agree to that because to have a child who's exceptionally cooperative not moving so that we get excellent images during a urodynamic can be a little tricky and in pediatric practice it is the storage phase that we are extremely concerned about and in that we don't need a child who's conscious and is aware and volitionally voiding on command in fact in many pediatric situations we don't need the voiding cooperation so much and this is where i may want a little sedation so that i get good imaging while is the urodynamics is going on so that may be one situation somebody has started sharing anyway uh, so uh, yes um, so what type of sedation do you use usually in children i i don't i almost never use any sedation in last so many years i have never used but if i were to use simultaneous video i made it very clear yeah. that may be the only situation in a non cooperative child yeah. and these situations are very far and few so i almost never use any sedation presentation by paul abrams uh, i i remember uh, i heard him saying about that even in uk 90% of the U- urodynamic studies are not uh, done properly Yeah. so uh, so so it it would be uh, we don't know what would be the proportion here in india so because we have very few uh, centers where they do a dedicated where you have a dedicated person who is doing a urodynamic study so what do you think uh, uh, how should uh, it uh, it be taken uh, particularly in our country um, because if it is not done properly then the whole purpose is lost so this so, is happening to the right uh, so in terms of imaging uh, what anita said uh, perfect and so i would say actually there are only two groups where imaging is usually not required and that's the elderly male and the regular urinary female stress in uh, urinary incontinence so a female urinary incontinence and the elderly male are the two groups where you don't need imaging i would yeah. say most of the other settings you actually need imaging and uh, uh, the thing is it, as long as you recognize the need for imaging and you combine it usually before but even if it's not before and patient has come to me i would still do it after and and not hand a urodynamics report at that point so obviously the patient has to come back but um, the need you need to be able to recognize that you need imaging uh now in terms of uh, uh, what setup to have i think for for a regular uh, uh, urology practitioner maybe not everybody needs to have a urodynamic there's nothing worse than having a poor quality trace done uh, 
because you know all of us get come across this situation where somebody's already had a urodynamics one week before and no information is forthcoming from it uh, it's a it's a bad quality study and then you are at a loss what to tell the patient so i think unless somebody has some real interest in that particular field it's probably best not to get into the field at all and trust to have a good colleague you trust uh, if you're doing regular regular work a regular urodynamics is fine if you want to really work in the field of functional urology then you should think about a uh, uh, video video urodynamics at your center but otherwise i think for most centers having a regular urodynamics with with or without uh, mcug should be fine right so uh Uh, Shivam, uh, may I add something to what Sanjay is saying? Yes, yes, yeah, I, I think quality control is extremely important. I mean, if you look at Paul Abrams's initial lectures, they all con were concerned about the quality control all over the world, for that matter. But he does go and lecture again all over the world. And I think uh, what happens in India today is majority of the centers are handled by postgraduate students, and I don't think they are the right people to be handling them. what we found as uh, urodynamics for all all these years a, a good technician whose job is to ensure that the recording is absolutely perfect and accurate that's all that is to be done rest of things is done done by us because we can then find out how to correlate the symptoms with the with the patient's findings stresses but a good technician can we can he has to ensure that the recording has to be absolutely accurate without any flaws and that is what every urodynamic center should ensure a technician who is trained properly and he just ensures that thing that that all that is required the rest of them we will of course manage but but i think yes a good department of urodynamics should have a good technician and of course a dedicated personnel like a urologist uh, dr sanjay do you think, do you think it can be managed that's acceptable Uh, or because the uh, uroflow urodynamics is something which requires a constant communication also with the patient and uh, the um, a lot of thing would depend upon that also so yeah. so i think uh, uh, what do you think uh, a clinician should do it or a technician can no so there are two skills in a urodynamics there is the technical skill and the clinical skill so if you know if you ask me today to do a urodynamics study i don't think i can do it for you <laughs> right i i lost the skill that there many years back when we started off i trained my technician by sitting on the machine myself but today if you ask me i don't think i can do it um uh, so there's a technical skill and a clinical skill you as a as a clinician you need to have the clinical skill the technical skill the technician needs to have and you have to supervise and make sure that he does it the right way and you know my technician now over years he knows exactly what i want so if you are so sub, whoever is supervising or in the room in the test must be aware of the interpretation of the findings so my technician understands and hence he can do my nurse understands so i've got a technician and a continence nurse and they both can do it independently they understand but uh, uh, so if if the technician doesn't understand then you need to be there so right. so uh, if if nobody understands during the test then you're in trouble <laughs> right. anyway. and, and that's just one point shivam that uh, Uh, as, as Sanjay said, is three-step uh, performance of urodynamic study is that the person who takes the history first generates urodynamic questions, and that has to be a clinician. It cannot be a technician. Okay. So, so we must understand what we are looking for. Are we looking for detrusor overactivity? Are we looking at detrusor function? Are we looking at safety of the bladder? Are we looking at the mechanism of incontinence? So that's urodynamic questions must be generated and clearly defined. before aerodynamic can can actually be performed so you tell her every investigation to the patient's needs and then the role of technician comes to know what exactly is to be done in this particular case do you follow do you, do, you, do you agree sanjay with right. this absolutely right so you need a dedicated technician plus a clinician who is all uh, supervising it so because otherwise you may not have a good interpretation and you know dr shivam a dedicated checklist must be there and that also can be done by a very well trained technician yeah. so for example at my place very often by the time i come anywhere on the screen uh, anywhere on the scene my nurse has already made a note whether the child has had an mcu whether a renal scan was done if the creatinine is showing a rising trend is this child capable of giving a voiding diary if yes has the voiding diary been done 
is the child on anti muscarin x you know all of these things must happen at autopilot level if you are a tertiary referral center so that there is no question of missing out on any of these points and in fact if you have a well trained technician and a nurse very often you may miss out on some of the points but they will not trust me so the trick is in having a highly dedicated team which is going to stay with you and not keep on changing every few months because in that case you are the one who's going to be sitting and doing everything from scratch every time and that is It's quite uh, quite tiring yeah i think yes that's the way uh, forward because uh, you have as in operation theater also we have a pre op checklist who checklist etc so any uh, procedure would require a proper checklist and an sop uh, prepared before we do it so that's no uh, i'll give you something very simple there so many times that my nurse would send away somebody who's come for a udm because there are people who have a habit of writing urinary incontinence advice urodynamics hmm. so before i come in the picture she will sit she will counsel the patient or the relative that these these are the bare minimum things required i'll give you a new appointment please do all of these Right. and so there is no question of getting saying that no no we did the urodynamic but there was no urine report available or we had no sonography no if you want to come out with quality material these things have to be done so it has to be ingrained in the heads of everybody who is controlling the urodynamic scene at your setup so you need to have a proper trained nursing staff yes yes that's that's yeah, very I entirely agree with what uh, Dr. Nita is saying. Only thing is that you know sometimes it becomes really difficult. Patients come from far away and out station and so on. So obviously we have to be pragmatic and judicious. But uh, you must recognize what is there and not there. In addition to uh, uh, the inf- what we discussed, the there is another role actually for your staff and support staff, and that is actually in terms of getting. Let's say all of our patients have records of patient reported outcome measures. so all of our uh, you know uh, let's say lower tract symptom patients give a record of male lts or uh, female lts ici uh, questionnaires which are long questionnaires they're like 20 to 25 questions uh, they do a six question udi is six our neurogenic patients do a 25 uh, 25 or 26 question uh, questionnaire patient reported outcome measure on neurogenic bladder and this happens for all of our patients of quality of life single question answer and it all gets captured into the report as well as in our database so all this takes time and effort Uh, so somebody needs to sit down with the patient record all this and then marry you know c- combine that with the uh, uh, study so that at the end when we actually have the information we have the entire inform- clinical information of the patient including the patient reported outcome measures so uh, again uh, such kind of a uh, ideal situation may not be possible everywhere so what do you think because urodynamics uh, in uh, any way it's an expensive investigation as a time consuming it's a cumbersome and uh, you may not get a good result if you do not have a very dedicated team so what about the non invasive urodynamic studies um, and what do you think uh, uh, could be the role of non invasive urodynamics in future like the ultrasound cystodynamogram about the bladder wall thickness the bladder weight and the ipp and then we have other uh, things like penile cuff and there are urethral devices and even a doppler ultrasound to measure the uh, intravesical pressure so uh, what do you think uh, could be role because they could be more simpler non invasive way to at least we can uh, select a very specific uh, population where we need to go to an uh, urodynamic case the thing is for most of the, so most of these are applicable to men rather than women and uh, the, the, the information that you get is at this point just i don't think it's really good enough you don't have good clinical de- correlation and so on uh, for the high risk groups where you are looking actually at you know safety and so on you don't have i i i get a feeling that at this point we are just not there in terms of non invasive uh, pressure measurements but the rest of the things that you said non so when you use the term urodynamics people uh, use the term urodynamics in a very global overarching sense of any kind of test which gives you an assessment of dynamic lower tract function in that sense even a bladder diary is a part of they considered a part of urodynamics but uh, so in that global overarching sense you get a wealth of information from the ultrasound scan the mcug talking to the patient and a good clinical examination uh, the bladder diary and so on 
but I think there are some situations where you just can't do without. And I think when residents, as a resident or you know, as a as a young clinician, when you actually work with Eurodynamics, you're able to get an idea of where you can manage without. The thing is uh, to be able to understand where you can do without it. Uh, your eyes get open when you use the test uh, as, a, as a as a part of your training. Uh, there's, there's some clinical situation, there's a kind of plus minus whether you, can, you should or should not use, but there are many situations where you just can't do without it. And those situations where you can't do it without it, it's better to refer the patient and get the urodynamics done from somebody reliable than to manage the patient without it. So patient has mixed incontinence, has storage symptoms, stress incontinence, and you want to operate, you must get a urodynamics. Your patient is a young patient, 45 years old, you're planning to do a bladder neck incision, must do a urodynamics. Uh, a patient has high risk uh, neurogenic uh, lower tract dysfunction, must do urodynamics. I mean, those are situations where saying that I don't have it is not enough. Uh, so I think a patient is your Parkinsonism, ob 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 oblique multisystem atrophy, you're planning to do a surgery, must do urodynamics. So these are situations where you can't do without. And uh, so, it, it, but there are some places where you can probably counsel the patient and you can tell that if this is the finding, these are your odds and what do you think you want to do? And that's fair enough. All right. I think, yeah. uh, Dr. Shivam, can yes. I just add something? Yes, you know, please. there's a tendency to say that this is an invasive test. It's an expensive test. We don't have it available at our place. And hence, there is a justification for not doing it. But then... Eurodynamic is far cheaper than doing a wrong surgery. Eurodynamic is far less invasive than operating on somebody when it is not indicated. And so let us, as soon as you put that filter, and as Sanjay has very rightly said, yes, your center may not have it, but in those isolated patients where you need it, rather than justifying why we didn't do it because we didn't have it, please send the patient somewhere because at the end of the day, you want the patient to do better, isn't it? Right. And so to justify not doing it because you don't have it, instead, yes, do your best to work up the patient with clinical applications as much as you can. But there will be that group who will need it, as Sanjay has emphasized, come what may. And there is indeed, it's non bailable in certain situations to not do it. So as right. long as we understand that, that's fine. Yeah, you rightly said that, yes, there are a specific uh, group of subset of uh, patients who definitely require urodynamic study. But I, I, I do, yes, yeah, I do remember that about, 20, about 25 years ago when I started, was thinking of, of uh, deploying a urodynamic department. I spoke to all my colleagues in one large meeting that do you think it's a good idea to have urodynamic evaluation, urodynamic investigation center in our city? And most of them said that we are carrying out well without it. <laughs> Why bother? <laughs> okay. and, and anyway, I, I, I was determined in somehow to start it. And let me tell you, from the day it started, the same people who say we don't need it have started referring the patients back to our center. That's, and that's how the whole scenario changed. And I think you should look for changing those scenarios rather than finding justifications of that we don't have this particular facility in our region. Soch badlo, desh badlega. Yes, there is definitely. There is a requirement of urodynamic. There is no doubt, but there are people who would probably uh, would not uh, do a proper clinical uh, examination or a proper history taking, and even the voiding diary. I think how many of us usually do a regular voiding diary in patients, which is probably can give you an ample amount of uh, um, information uh, many, in many patients. So, uh, Dr. Sanjay, do you think that voiding diary should be made mandatory in most of these patients with lower unit tract symptoms? Because uh, definitely it can give you a lot of uh, information. So, you know, my usage of the bladder diary has gone like this over the years. Right. And now I would say that it's really, if you have to do good quality management, you must have it. And, and not just must have it, there are situations where the same patient does it more than once. By more than once, I don't mean more than one day on more than one instance in their management. And uh, so even my online patients and all, everybody, so I have, they all get a message to contact my secretary on this number to learn how to make their bladder diary, even if it's an online concert. So I think a bladder diary is critical, especially for storage. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, also for storage with voiding these functions and a whole lot, lot of others. So just one example to show you the critical importance of the bladder diary. Uh, in the last uh, eight, nine years, we have picked up, I think, 19 patients with diabetes insipidus related upper tract damage, um, where a simple bladder diary was never done. And they've had a whole lot of investigation and DI not picked up. So as a urologist, I picked up DI in some 19 patients. And these are patients with urine outputs of seven, eight, nine liters. I can tell you now I can spot this when the patient comes. And uh, you know, it's almost like a sixth sense, which tells me that there's a problem with the bladder, with the urine volume. And uh, you'll be surprised uh, how critical volume can be in, uh, in, in the findings that you get. So the large, la even if the patient doesn't have a DI, substantially large urine volumes can actually grossly alter the morphological impact of the same lower tract dysfunction. So the same level of lower tract dysfunction and one patient who habitually produces three liters a, a day for the last 20 years and the other who produces 1.25 liters a day for 20 years, you will find difference in the morphology of the, of the urinary tract. And this is something that is not there in textbooks, but um, it's important to understand because sometimes you're puzzled. Why is there upper track chain like this? Why is this particular thing happening? And unless you actually look into this, this aspect of the patient's management, you will not be able to pick these problems up. You're right. Well, we can, uh, there, at least in patients with some, uh, nocturia, nocturia. Oh, nocturia, it's nocturia. absolutely mandatory. Huh? Pardon? Absolutely mandatory. Absolutely Man. mandatory. And we are not in a habit of doing avoiding diary. Most of I, if you do a survey, I think only 5-10% would be probably using avoiding diary. Um, you know, so I think we should stress upon this fact also that it is very important to avoiding diary. So uh, before we wind up, uh, we will just try to, uh, uh, like in one of the Paul Abrams uh, lecture also, I heard that uh, the future of urodynamics and uh, functional urology, uh, we have like in uh, urethral pressure profilometry, we have almost abandoned uh, in last few years. And what he is saying that the way we are doing is probably not the right way. And there are uh, many patients who have urethral instability, he says, and urethral hypertension. And that can be picked up if you do a proper urethral uh, profilometry and that they can be managed properly if you, do, uh, if you can actually get these patients. Those who do not have any bladder changes, but they have some urethral changes, uh, which can be missed if you just simply do a simple urodynamics. Uh, yes. So to answer your question, I, so UPP obviously f is not a regular UDS tool. Uh, we have UPP in, in our machine and we sporadically use it, but we are increasingly incorporating it into some subgroups of patients. So there are some patients, so the urethral instability part is a plus minus for me. So I, the, the main situation where I think the UPP can, uh, is, has some potential use is patients in whom we suspect that uh, some form of urethral, uh, you can say, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, pelvic floor dysfunction or sphincter dysfunction is reflexly inhibiting a bladder contraction. So if I have that kind of thing in mind, uh, it's, it's a subgroup of patients. That's a group of patients in whom one may think of doing it. Uh, from a practical perspective, how much, what difference does it make? There might be some difference in these patients because if you can get the sphincter spasm or the pelvic floor spasm to come down, maybe they'll be able to initiate a detrusor contraction. So that's one group of patients in whom perhaps, you know, there is a potential role. And in, it's this, this is the group of patients in whom actually there is more of a comeback of UPP in, in specialized centers. Otherwise, it's a question of training. Uh, people who are trained as urogynecologists typically by gynecology departments tend to do the UPP. And they, people who are trained uh, you know, in, in urology units don't use the UPP. But most of the guideline documents that you see, they don't have UPP at all anywhere figuring in the, in the guideline documents. So none of the guideline documents actually uh, uh, have, you don't have guidance with regard to UPP findings because they're not really that standardized in terms of uh, their utility. But there is, uh, one must recognize that there are patients in whom the UPP can be useful and it's a good uh, research tool, especially if you're working in the area. Yeah. And another uh, thing Dr. Shivam, can yes. I leave yes. with your kind permission? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sanjay. I'm so sorry, oh, Shirish, I'm interrupting. No, no, no. But I have to be elsewhere. This is, this is I have to be elsewhere at 8 30. So you. thank you so much for thank asking you. me. And Sanjay, as always, you've done a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I will just uh, 
when I was just going through one of those presentations of Dr. Uh, uh, Paul Abrams, he said that one of these patients who had this urethral instability when treated with neuromodulator interstamens, they uh, it, um, it was managed uh, very well. Uh, so, so, so yeah. what the answer to that would be that many of these conditions which you are talking about, the neuromod sacral neuromodulation is a blunt instrument which actually is widely applicable in terms of you can try using it across many of these conditions and you don't need a UPP to do it. I mean, so let's say if, if, if a patient has a vo unexplained voiding dysfunction and you, you have, let's say, pelvic floor dyssynergia, let's say, for instance, you don't need to do a UPP to decide to use sacral neuromodulation. We know that whether or not you use the UPP, about 40-50% of them will have some improvement with use of neuromodulation. So really, whether the, the, the UPP actually uh, would trigger my use of the neuromodulation, I don't think so. If the patient is able to afford it, I would plan for the sacral neuromodulation regardless of the findings. But there are some situations where I think it is definitely of benefit and I would use it in those situations. So, so patients who have this, you know, overactive uh, uh, bladder type symptoms and you feel that it's a urethral instability. And this is again a disputed entity altogether. It's not there in any of the guideline documents. Uh, then any way for refractory OAB neuromodulation is a part of the treatment, right? But there's no data to show this, this so-called, there's very little data on it. So let's not get into that territory. But yes, UPP does have some limited role. All right. So any, any last comments on what is the future of urodynamics? So one one comment I would like to say is that I think I was a little rushed uh, in those 35, 40 minutes. And each of the conditions that we actually discussed are themselves worthy of a full hour's discussion. So we did, for instance, recently for Colombia and South America, I did a whole one and a half hour session just on DSD. Just right. one finding. So, I mean, it's, it's possible to have a discussion in depth on any one of these aspects. Uh, so I recognize that a whole lot of stuff that we have not covered today, which uh, is worthy of being covered. Uh, but you're all residents. I'm sure you're reading much more than we ever did. And you, you actually have a lot of information that uh, we don't have uh, in our heads right now. So you can probably incorporate it all there. Rest, I think, uh, it, from the, the one message that I would leave, like to leave everybody is with, that in a neurogenic, especially uh, is, uh, bladder dysfunction, neurogenic lower tract dysfunction, storage pressures are critically important. If you can just keep this one thing in mind, I think you will save a lot of your patients from getting into renal failure and perhaps even dying. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Dr. Shirish, any last comment from your side and then we will wind up. Dr. Shirish? I think there is some signal problem. I think we lost him. Ah, we lost him. So there's some. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Thank I, you. Must, I must thank you. It's a real pleasure. It was to a see real your... pleasure to have you and really honor. And uh, uh, I think the, the, the residents must have benefited a lot. And then uh, later in future, we definitely look forward to have a, a longer kind of workshop kind of thing on Eurodynamics. And sure. uh, we will surely do it. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. And good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night.